marriage is where a couple wants to stay together, but the prohibitive cost of health care and other things may warrant seeking what's called a medical divorce due to one spouse's illness. And here to talk with me about that is Michelle Petrowski with Being in Abundance. Michelle, welcome. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me today. Oh, it's a pleasure, and it will be a pleasure to have you uh, walk us through what a medical divorce is. I'm sure there are plenty of people that are unfamiliar with the term. Where to begin? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, um, I'd like to start with a study from the Kaiser Foundation in 2015. Um, they were talking at that point, and this is, you know, how many years ago, that 26% of adults questioned it during the survey, either themselves or a family member had had difficulty paying for medical costs. And healthcare uh, costs, according to debt.org, are approaching $4.3 trillion a year, and 33% of GoFundMe accounts are to pay for medical costs. And the other thing I thought was really kind of crazy but interesting was 60 to 65% of bankruptcies are actually related to medical costs. So to just kind of set the stage on what's going on with folks, um, a medical bankruptcy or divorce um, really is because a couple is facing a situation where either the non-ill spouse might be left without assets because of the ill spouse, or maybe there's a situation where there's a child with disabilities or special needs in the family, and they want to make sure that they're not depleting the assets of the whole family unit due to that situation as well. And so they might be faced now with a situation that to just reduce the depletion of the assets, that divorce seems like the only way to go. Yeah, those certainly seem like um, good reasons, but hard decisions to make. How, did, how does the, <laughs> I guess two things. One is how do you get your arms around doing this emotionally? I, obviously the finances seem to make sense on paper, but emotionally it seems a, a high hurdle. I would agree with that. I couldn't even imagine being in that situation, honestly. Um, but I guess when you're really looking at the numbers on paper, anything I really read, and I haven't personally experienced this, so I'm going to be honest about that. But anything I really read, it wasn't because people were necessarily fighting over the money. It's because, you know, they're looking at the big picture and saying, how can we maximize the benefits for our family? And uh, one of the ways to do that is through divorce. When we transfer the income and the assets, it's considered a non-taxable event. And in the case of Medicare, it actually, Medicaid rather, it actually negates the five-year look-back rule into income and assets. Yeah. So you talked about some of the health issues that affect people that may want to go through this. Uh, we've looked at a lot of things like the cost of Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, perhaps the uh, the inability to pay for long-term care costs because you're, you don't have a policy perhaps or your policy is inadequate. And obviously there's the rising costs of health care, which uh, is, 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 is dramatic. Yes, yes. So, you know, typically uh, from what I read, the medical debt is higher among elderly folks for the reasons that you just mentioned. I mean, Alzheimer's and dementia alone, folks can live for years and they typically need round the clock care and they need to be in a special unit. And so they will have to be in a longer term care facility and that can become very expensive at tens of thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So I think you hinted a little bit about how the medical divorce works where the assets are what typically transferred to the healthy uh, spouse. So as not to have them counted as part of their income and assets. Is that the gist of it? Yeah, I mean, if it's actually an ill spouse, that's the idea. Um, so that the income and the assets are not included in those of the ill spouse. So they'll be transferred to the community or the healthy spouse. Um, if we have a child with disabilities and we're talking about special needs, then we would actually transfer the assets to the parent that doesn't have custody of that child. And so that would be the way to, um, yeah, because now that that parent has less income and assets, they're going to be able to maximize the benefits for that child. Yeah. So, so I've read um, that a medical divorce doesn't mean that the couple actually splits up, that they intend to continue their relationship, but just separate their finances as much as possible. That's what, exactly. And that's what I was reading too, um, that yeah, you know, loving families who want to stay together, but they're facing this devastating financial situation and this potentially is a way to get around that and make sure that they're minimizing the financial impact to the family and be able to keep them intact. Yeah. 
from your perspective, are there any sort of uh, gutches or you know potholes that people need to be wary of if they're contemplating a medical divorce? Um, one of the things that I was thinking about was um, sometimes, well, you, one of the things you'd want to find out is if we stayed together, would the IRA of the non-ill spouse be considered part of the income and assets of the ill spouse? Um, also now, and then that might help you in that decision-making process to decide, do we need to do something? Um, also, we know that when a couple is married and one spouse dies, the beneficiary, there are special, um, special special rules around that, right? Now, if you get divorced, you're not going to have the benefit of that inherited spouse, those rules as well. I think, though, from what I was reading, there really are a lot of other alternatives as well. So. I got the feeling that you definitely don't have to go this route. There are other things to consider. Um, I have a list of them, so I'm just going to kind of touch upon them. There's like something called a Miller Trust. Uh, sometimes that's called a Qualified Income Trust. Um, irrevocable Funeral Plans. A Medical Compliant Annuity. Uh, there's also Long-Term Care Partnership Plans. And ABLE Accounts. And Pooled Income Trust. So I think that there are other alternatives. I wouldn't just run to divorce. I would say go see someone that specializes in this area of law and planning and really have them walk you through what your options are so you can make that right decision for your family. Yeah. Uh, let me throw one more question out at you, which is oftentimes someone might have a defined benefit plan. And uh, in most divorces, there might be a quadro that has to be uh, issued. Is that something that you anticipate a medical divorce would have to have as well? Yeah. So. Divorce and um, Medicaid laws are actually state dependent. So if you're going to get divorced, regardless of the reason, you ha you're going to be following A, your state law. Uh, B, a defined benefit plan is an ERISA plan. And whether you got divorced because somebody cheated, you fell out of love, or there are medical reasons, you're still going to need that qualified domestic relations order to divide up that asset if that's the route you're going. Right. And then, so there's a, 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 as you mentioned, it really behooves you to get a qualified estate planning attorney or a financial planner that might have the CDFA designation, for instance. Uh, any other thoughts about like what kind of professional should be on your team? I, well, I, I, I would really look at, honestly, if it was me and I was thinking about a medical divorce, I would go to someone that specializes in Medicaid and special needs planning. I would go to them first and I find that the CDFA is most helpful if you're looking for an equitable di distribution. In this case, we're not really looking for an equitable distribution. We're looking to kind of load up one parent versus or one spouse versus the other so that the other person could maximize their benefit. But to my point before, there are so many other options I found that maybe that one doesn't even really make sense to force. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Medicaid. I think there's a case where people are familiar but not necessarily expert in all things Medicaid. So it sounds like they should go in with their eyes wide open in terms of what Medicaid will pay for and what it will cover and what the experience will be like. Is that fair to say? I would agree with that. I mean, I believe that regular Medicaid um, actually doesn't cover nursing home. There's like a, the, the institutional Medicaid. So it's almost like a whole other special flavor. And from what I was really reading um, there's something called the Medicaid waiver that was instituted in 1988 to help protect one's spouse from being impacted or being li left potentially indigent because they're spending all their assets on the other person, which is why I'm saying I think you really need someone who is proficient in Medicaid planning to really help you figure out that way. Is divorce really the only way to go? Yeah. Well, it certainly seems like an option well worth considering. Anything we missed or bears reemphasizing by chance? No, I think at this point we covered everything. Um, I would really leave it to those that specialize in that area. Yeah. Well, Michelle, it's a pleasure having you share your knowledge and wisdom with our viewers and our readers. And uh, we hope that you'll continue writing articles for Retirement Daily and doing more of these videos with us. So thank you. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Robert. Have a great day. It was my pleasure.